Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of Warbird Wednesdays. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. I'm going to reach over here and grab my pencil. And today we are going to talk about one of the most iconic American aircraft of the 20th century. As, and built, by the way, by the same manufacturer. You could say the P-51 was the Cadillac of the sky, and the North American uh, Aircraft Corporation came along with another iconic airplane, the F-86, the Sabre. So we're going to talk about that today. Of course, Greg has maybe taken a step back today. This is, uh, I'm, I'm one of the, the uh, Robin Hood, and Greg is one of my merry men. And I have, uh, this is a little bit more sedate than some of the things he's thrown at me the last couple of weeks. So I'm going to lose my hat today and uh, we'll get the hair down as we normally do toss off camera perfect catch again by mr kenny today he is my wool gathering assistant that's actually easy to pronounce i have no idea what wool gathering means and greg has been taking a step back oh there we go one of our jets going by hopefully my audio is not getting blown out but we will go and talk about the f-86 the saber jet now F-86 was uh, probably, again, one of the most iconic airplanes uh, ever made. It had its uh, first flight in 1947, and it was introduced in 1949. Now, this airplane in its uh, early iterations, and pretty much all the way through, unless it was in a, a situation where it could get a little bit more speed, was subsonic. It was right underneath uh, the... Uh, uh, being a supersonic airplane at 0.9 Mach or high 680 miles an hour. It was an interesting airplane. But, Greg, today we're going to do like a Fred Fun section. How's that? We're going to expand it. You asked and we gave you more. We're going to give you a little bit more. Now, what we're going to talk about today, just in the beginning, is the concept of swept wing design and we have had a conversation before, and we every once in a while we go back to the Germans, because Greg, the Germans in their uh, flight technology really were the ones at the end of the war, primarily out of desperation, were pushing all kinds of stuff. We talked about last week about the Parasite, about the Mistel, we've talked about the Focke-Wulf 190, we've talked about ME-109, we've talked a little bit about the ME-262, we're going to talk about the 262 again today. Of course, the 262, the first operational uh, combat operational uh, jet fighter, followed by the British. They had one, the Meteor. But you can see the plan view of the 262. Now, these big uh, engines that were hung off of this, initially, the 262, by the way, Greg, did you know this? It was a tail dragger. It actually had a tail, a tail wheel. And they had problems with that. They didn't like the way that it ground handled. So they, they put it up on its nose, gave it tricycle landing gear, which is pretty much uh, definitive of aircraft that have come since then. The other thing they did was, you know, we talked about straight wing jets. The 262 has this uh, slightly swept wing. Now, part of that was because of the... Uh, the center of gravity, the CG on the airplane, was, the, was a, a problem with a straight wing, so they dropped these big engines back to improve the center of gravity. Now, when they did that, German engineers came across something, which was fantastic, the Fred Fun Fact, and that was that a swept wing helped them with airflow and made the airplane a little bit faster. Now, Greg, you're saying, Fred, why, why is that? Well, Think about this. The aircraft, as they get up to the sound barrier, they're getting hit by these shock waves. And the swept wing design smooths the shock wave out a little bit. We've talked about the Coke bottle effect with some of the supersonic airplanes and changes with the fuselage, but the swept wing was really where we started in improving the performance as we get up to higher and higher Mach numbers as we go through the speed of sound. This was the airplane that started it all. Now, how does that relate, you're asking, Mr. Kenny, to the F-86? Well, I will tell you. How it relates is 
the F-86 was the first American jet fighter, and we'll go with a plan view here, the first American jet fighter to benefit from German swept wing uh, research. It was the first one that got it. A lot of them, like we talked about the F-84 last week and the Thunderstreak, a lot of aircraft emulated it. Now you'll notice when I threw up the uh, ME-262 and you look at a plan view, you'll see a much greater rate rake on this. Now I'm not going to get into the NACA rating on this airplane. It does have a NACA rating on the wing, but it had automatic slats, which you can go out, the ME-262 and the F-86 both had that. And you can go out and look that up, kids at home, and uh, slats, wing slats. But again, we're changing the wing design, so the different speed characteristics, and we're also dealing with that shock wave. So you move that wing back, you help with the shock wave and the buffeting over the airplane. So this is the F-86 Sabre, Greg. Isn't that exciting? I'm excited about it. Now, the airplane, again, uh, first flew in the late 40s and introduced in the late 40s. Uh, speeds were just up to about 0.9 Mach, high 600 mile an hour range. It retained the, and, I'm, and we're going to talk about this airplane behind me because, Greg, this airplane behind me is a little bit different. It's just a little bit different. So uh, the uh, North American version of this airplane retained the um, 40s, the, the World War II armament and three 50 caliber machine guns on either side. Remember, at that time, we didn't really have air-to-air uh, -air missiles, so this was still a gunfighter, so it had to be maneuverable. It had a radar-guided gun sight. It was a radar gun sight in the nose. It had an aiming gun sight in the nose. It was an air breather. Now, this thing, as you can see, Greg, can get a shot of that nose up there. That uh, had a, The F-86 had a J-47 in it. We're going to tar talk about an engine variant here as well in this particular aircraft behind me, but um, this uh, airplane was key in a very historical context. And what was that, Greg? It was the Korean War. The MiGs came in and the MiG-15, and you can go back and look at the segment on the MiG-15, but the the MiG-15 was essentially a game changer, just like this 262 is a game changer in that prior conflict. And so what happened was American forces got caught flat-footed. They got caught flat-footed in two different ways. One, we didn't, we had jet fighters, but we've talked about the early ones behind this one, the Panther or the F-84 and some other ones. They didn't have the necessary performance of the MiG because the Russians had reverse engineered that British engine. The, the uh, MiG could outclimb and outroll them. It was just a really good airplane. And the, uh, the Allies had the problem that the early war fighters that the Allies had fielded were not really up to snuff in comparison. And the other problem, Greg, was is we were caught in that propeller transition, right? So we had P-51s, Corsairs, you had airplanes over there that had definite uh, speed and performance disadvantages, and there was a, a big one. What was that? B-29. We were using B-29s. So you can imagine, we are using late World War II bombers against a fighter. First of all, you remember the MiG had those cannons in it. It was designed to go after fighter, or uh, bombers rather. And it, uh, and it was so much faster. So the Americans with the F-86 rushed the F-86 into the conflict. What they were trying to do in Korea was gain air superiority and, and really slow down. Things for the Allies on the ground uh, were not going well. They were essentially at risk of losing the entire Korea Peninsula, Korean Peninsula. And the challenge was they... Uh, the only thing that could keep them in the game, and, and really did, was air power. And what is a lesson? If you didn't learn anything from World War II, you have to have air superiority over the ground conflict area, because if you don't, and the Germans found this out, uh, especially in uh, Normandy and the Battle of France, and, and to a certain extent against the Battle of the Soviet Union, you cannot move men and su supplies in daylight 
down roads uh, if the enemy has air superiority. We bled the Germans, the Allies bled the Germans white, and to a certain extent, later in the war, as we achieved complete air superiority with its air superiority, say that fast, Greg, with the Japanese, uh, we bled both of those uh, adversaries white from a standpoint that they just couldn't move supplies, they couldn't protect their equipment, they couldn't protect their installations, and it was all for air superiority. And that axiom in modern combat falls all the way through to the Gulf War. If you look at the Iraqis, uh, who had numerically superior uh, against the forces that went into Kuwait, uh, the U.S. and other forces in Kuwait, the, but they were rapidly attrited by superior air power, and they were just bombarded day and night. No adversary can really survive that. It just doesn't work. So that axiom started in the Korean War. So the Americans were trying to essentially, we talked about the uh, F-84 being a really good ground attack airplane and being used in ground attack and the Panther and P-51s and Corsairs, but the Americans had to fight to get air superiority and, and, and there was a real risk at that time that they weren't gonna get it with that MiG. That, remember, the, the Russians were flying the MiGs under red flag, what we call red flag MiGs or red star MiGs, and, the, and then there were Korean pilots. And they really did pose a serious threat to allied air superiority or over the battlefield in the early days of the Korean War. So this airplane was the airplane that was a, on a good day, an even match in performance for the MiG. Now there's a couple of things that also were game changers. What do you think they were, Greg? One was that radar gun sight in the nose of the airplane. The other thing was the American pilots, a lot of them were returning from World War II, and they understood air combat maneuvering, ACM. They had been in combat. They basically just took those skills, dusted them off, and pretty soon we, we had essentially wrestled uh, air superiority from the North Koreans, and essentially the war on the ground evolved into a stalemate. But the United States, uh, from, um, from the early, about the midpoint of the war, had complete air dominance, and the the uh, North Koreans and the Russians were continued to be dangerous, but the United States was no longer at risk of losing air superiority. So this airplane was the key to that, and that this North American product. Now, it set the stage. What's interesting about this is, and I pause a little bit, because one thing that, that you think about, Greg, is airplanes are going faster and faster, and we've talked about the F-100 and the F-105, but this airplane was a gunfighter. The Air Force would push to get, and all the services would push to get faster and faster airplanes. They would drop the gun and they would go to missiles. And what did they find out in uh, Vietnam, Greg? Believe it or not. Oh, and you also see, the other thing I was gonna say is look at that beautiful, that beautiful canopy up there and that, that ability to be able to see. As we pushed people into faster and faster airplanes, they got further down into the airplane. Visibility went away. The ability of the airplane to combat, to dogfight would go away. And uh, you would think that with this definitive product in, uh, in Korea, that they would, they would have said, oh, this is the way we want to go. It didn't happen. The engineers drove the airplanes further the other direction. And it wasn't until... Vietnam, again, when we ran into upgraded versions of the MiG, the MiG-21, and heavy air combat in Vietnam, that the services went, wait a minute, we lost something. We lost the ability to dogfight. We couldn't dogfight, which is how Top Gun happened. But this airplane set the stage and could be considered the great-grandfather of the F-16, the F-18, all of these later dogfighting to a certain extent, the F-14, airplanes that were designed to have air combat maneuvering, good visibility, a lot of punch, and retain air, air superiority. That all started with this particular airplane. So, uh, Greg, this is one of the most important aircraft that you have. Now, um, the other thing is, and how the, the chickens came home to roost. I'm not wearing my chicken hat, but the chickens came home to roost in this airplane, Greg, when uh, they did a study called uh, Feather Duster, and this was against the MiG-17, which was an upgraded uh, a MiG-15, and we've talked about the MiG-17. 
highly maneuverable, did have an afterburner, but the Air Force concluded that with the uh, MiG-17, the optimum airplane to fight it was not the F-100, which was one of their frontline airplanes like that. You couldn't fight it with an F-105. It was an F-86H model, which was by that point a very, you know, forgotten airplane at that point. So you can believe, you can see how um, air combat maneuvering had come full circle from the two conflicts. Now, this airplane in front of me, Greg, you may want to get a shot of that nose. There's something on that nose that is different um, from the from the F-86 that I'm holding in my hand, and that is that 30 millimeter cannon in the nose. This airplane, for you aficionados at home, you're going, that is not an American-made F-86. You are absolutely right. Go to the fridge, get yourself a cookie and a nice cold glass of milk, because you are right. This is not an American-built Sabre. This is a CAC Sabre that was built under license. It's considered, was uh, built in the late 50s and in the early 60s. It is considered to be probably the most definitive uh, of the version. It had that 30 millimeter cannon. It has a 60% redesigned fuselage because it is actually has a Rolls-Royce Mark 26, which gave it 50% more thrust, Greg, if you can believe that. This airplane also carried an AIM-9 missile, if you can believe that. So this was a, the last of the version flown by some foreign air forces very, very hard hitting airplane and pretty much the end of the line. Now this aircraft, I'm gonna go ahead and put this down. We're getting a pile of jets here, which I don't wanna drop and drop the Germans. That would be bad. Break that ME-262. Then my archivist is gonna be very upset with me. This airplane is in the livery though of the gentleman who the hangar is named after, Ken Miles. Major General Ken Miles, this, he always said, he's passed away, but Ken said that uh, this was his favorite airplane that he flew. We have a F-100, the type that he flew uh, in Vietnam, and we have, this is Ken's Kitten, which has the colorful nose art. Uh, I don't know whose Ken's Kitten that was, but uh, this is Ken's Kitten. It is signed by a number of F-86 pilots, and again, we do this with, um, with always naming the jets or tying the jet, jets back to an aviator or, uh, or a docent or somebody in history that actually was tied to the type. So this airplane uh, is dedicated to Ken Miles and to the Miles family, God bless you, thank you. We appreciate everything you've done. This is the Ken Miles hangar. Now, I'm going to do something landmark here my wool gathering assistant, I do not know that we have ever done aluminum. I don't think we've ever done aluminum can. So we are going to, Greg has gotten really, really far-fetched today. This is T-Julia, T-Julia, I think, organic tea soda, mint tea, hibiscus, lemonade, naturally caffeine-free, of course. Uh, it is ethically sourced. This can, this bottling can, whatever you want to call it, it has its um, uh, <laughs> tea soda. Get it in your mouth. Born in Bangladesh, made in Denver. So that's interesting. Uh, 80 calories. Um, oh, there's a lot of sugar in this. 14% sugar. Greg, you're helping me out here. Uh, I don't see. Oh, uh, sell by date 12:420. So this one we're coming up. So get the uh, the uh, poison control on speed dial. I don't think this is carbonated in any way. So I, I'm going to take a swig of this, Greg. I'm a little afraid. Aluminum, here we go. <laughs> oh, ow. That's disgusting. I would try it one more time, but oh, oh, after three home runs, Greg, this, oh, sorry. I mean, maybe this just isn't my, oh, my palate. Oh, my goodness. We're going to try it one more, Greg, just one more. 
Um, wow. We're going to put that one down. Um, of course, uh, T. Julia Tea Soda is not a sponsor of the program. <laughs> They're probably not going to be. After they saw my face, they wouldn't be. But, oh, oh, and the after the aftertaste on that one, Greg, is just so special as well. So, uh, this is the F86 Sabre. Now, for our gratuitous product placement, Greg, I have something very exciting. We have gone all out. We have gone all out. We have an F86 shirt that was personally illustrated by Greg Kenny. No, I'm kidding. It was not. But it does have, look at, it's got the F86 uh, this has the three, the three machine guns, the 50s on either side. That is a, um, a Korean War vintage fighter. You can go out and get this on our web store. It will make you, as I always say, at least 15 miles an hour faster. And if a MiG sees you wearing this shirt, I guarantee you the MiG will go the other way. Do you think so, Greg? What do you think? The MiG removal device? So this shirt, you can go out and, and pick one up. It is... It's, I like the color. I really like this. This is a new shirt in our collection. The, uh, so our, our uh, Jason, our uh, Jer Bear, as we call him, we've talked about him before, uh, in the gift shop, our buyer is, is really getting out there. So get out to the, to the web store and pick yourself up one of these F86 shirts. You're going to want that. Now, I didn't, you know what I didn't do? That product was, you know, and never say that I'm not going to take one for the team, Craig. I'm going to take one for the team because guess what I did? This thing bit me back so hard. What did I forget? I forgot the salute. I did not salute. So first of all, if you didn't know Ken Miles, I believe on our YouTube channel his interview is up. But uh, I want to say to Ken Miles and Miles family, the and Ken was a dedicated aviator and all the guys that flew the F-86, this at this time uh, in history for the United States was pretty much life or death. If they failed, uh, we could have we could have lost that conflict. So to all of you F-86 drivers, to Ken Miles and the Miles family, to Ross Miles and his family, God bless you. And I'm going to venture into whatever this is again. And you know what, Greg, that just doesn't get any better. I'm going to have to go and brush my teeth after <laughs> that. Is wow, that has a bad aftertaste. But the, uh, as I said, the F-86 set up uh, really the, laid the groundwork for all the air superiority fighters that came after that. Uh, it benefited from this, this really uh, swept wing, smaller, narrow wing that a lot of the later follow-on aircraft would have. The one thing that you do want to note on this too, and we see it on the MiGs, is those wing gates that regulate airflow over the wing. And as I said, it, it had uh, slats, which automatic slats and the ability to change the wing, which is, is critically important as we get into these, these different airfoils and these thinner airfoils in these modern jets. So with that, I'm going to wrap up on the F-86. I want to thank you for visiting us today, with us today. Go out to the YouTube channel, see this video, hit that subscribe button, smash it, that subscribe button. Like us on Facebook, get out to the web store and get yourself one of those shirts. I want to thank you for joining us. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Have a great day.